was about a month ago, I was uh, maybe a little longer than that, I was rooting through the internet and trying to find things that I could use. Is that loud enough? Can y'all hear me? It sounds awful low over here. Danny, you can turn me up a little bit. I appreciate it. Is that uh, I was going through the internet trying to find stuff for news nuggets and insights. And I came across, it says, Four Chaplains Day. I said, what in the world is Four Chaplains Day? So it caught my interest. And then I went through and I began reading about these four chaplains during World War II. Four different chaplains from four different faiths. And, and it was so inspiring. It was a story of courage, of faith, of devotion, and sacrifice. Then I found out that there was a video that went along with it, and there's a whole bunch of videos. When you start looking for something, if you can target in on a specific subject, you'll find the Internet's full of it. You just didn't know it until you open your eyes and say, whoa, look what's there. So this was one of those stories. So as I read this story, a spirit inside of me was kindled. And I said, well, normally when that happens, you know, there's, for me, there's a reason I need to go look and see what's going on. Sometimes it's kindled that it's anger. And I'm sure everybody here has the same feelings and emotion. It's being in touch with the spirit that God grants inside of us. So I went back and I started looking at this story. So I want to talk about that story, and I'm going to show you one of the videos in just a few minutes. I just want to give you a little bit of background. Then I want to show you the amazing connection between looking at a story like this, of the example of these men. Of course, you might say, yeah, but these people don't have the truth. I'm going to show you something in just a few minutes about this. Then I'm going to take it into a biblical account with the Apostle Paul and Timothy and show you how all of this applies to you and I in our dedication lining up to Passover this year, which I thought this was the perfect time to be able to share that. So let me give you, first of all, a little bit of background about these men. The four chaplains also referred to as the immortal chaplains or the Dorchester chaplains were four World War II chaplains who died re rescuing civilian and military personnel as the troop ship SS Dorster sank on February 3rd, 1943. It had only been about a week since it left New York. And it was heading over to Europe, and they had to stop to be refilled and charged before they actually went across the Atlantic when they were sunk. The Dorchester was a civilian liner that was converted for military service. In World War II, it was a shipping administration of troop transports. She was able to carry slightly more than 900 military passengers and crew, and on this particular day, it was full. The waters they were going into was about 34 degrees. That means whoever went into the water had about five minutes before the body began to shut down. The ship left New York January 23rd 1943, en route to Greenland, carrying about 900 others as part of a convoy of three ships escorted by the Coast Guard cutters, the Tampa, the Escanaba, and the Comanche. During the early morning hours of February 3rd, the vessel was torpedoed by the German submarine U-223 just off Newfoundland in the North Atlantic. That was the beginning of the story that I've seen about these men that they have determined to have the four chaplains days. Let's play that video and I'll be back to tell you more about the story. The Dorchester was docked there in New York City. The chaplains joined the throngs of men that were gathering on board the ship. There were four chaplains. One was a Roman Catholic priest named John Washington. Another was a Jewish rabbi named Alexander Good. There was two Protestants, Chaplain Poling and Chaplain Fox. They were all lieutenants. They had all gone to chaplain school. And the four of them found that they all had so much in common. They thought in terms of humanity and not just in terms of their own individual community. America in 1943 was deeply divided. Those who did not share the same skin color 
or worship God in the same way, lived largely apart, separated by prejudice, suspicion, and hate. Americans often focused more on how they differed with those of other beliefs than on what they shared in common. That you had four chaplains who were of differing religious backgrounds and different faith groups were able to put aside those differences was really a testimony to their understanding that in order to be victorious, we had to work together. A lesson the chaplains would teach every day with every breath. A lesson that would prove vital when the ship and its young soldiers sailed into deadly waters and into the crosshairs of a Nazi wolf pack. The Dorchester ended up pulling in three days later to Newfoundland. The ship offloaded its precious cargo of men, not to sightsee, but rather for a 10-mile ruck march. After the Dorchester left uh, St. John's and went into the open sea, the Germans got word that the convoy was heading toward Greenland. The Dorchester was now on a collision course with the enemy. Fear would stalk the decks. Its primary antidote, faith, and the four chaplains who understood its power. On February 3rd, 1943, at one o'clock in the morning, we heard this tremendous explosion. We were hit by a torpedo. The torpedo hit into the right side of the ship. Everything went black. All lights disappeared. And of course, everybody running like lunatic. It was every man for himself. People were frantic. People who didn't forgot their life preservers. People who didn't have clothes on. Some of them were crying. They were just caught completely surprised, and they didn't know what to do. The chaplains made their way to the top deck, doing everything that they could to try to give soldiers some direction in order to save as many lives as they possibly could. The four chaplains took off their life preservers and gave it to men, four strange soldiers, who didn't have a life preserver on. And they gave it to them so that they could possibly survive this ordeal. These chaplains, they could have been the first one to jump overboard into the lifeboat. They could have kept their life vest, but they made decisions. They were very courageous men. The ship was about to go down, but the chaplains were about to lift their men to new heights. The four would come together to shine a beacon of hope in the ship's darkest hour. That's when I saw these four men standing arm in arm on the top of the boat. The chaplains locked arms and prayed together. They linked arms, and then they joined in singing hymns, each of them in a different language. One was Latin, one was Hebrew, another was English, and they were humming these songs while the ship went down. To see them in that disheveled moment of um, disaster all around them, and yet, this inner calm in these four men, as they ministered to the people around them, was, as one man said, as close to heaven as I ever hoped to be. You know, when I saw that, some of the first things that went through my mind is I, I wondered about the Church of God, the Church of God community, who quite often don't want to speak to one another or churches who feel that they're better than another church or another church organization. You have to wonder at the end time when our ship that we live on today called Earth, when it goes down, 
before the return of Jesus Christ. So I began to wonder, so like, what in the world is it going to be like for you and I? So I thought about this story in the light of this, and I wrote about it in a think in a newsletter that just went out. Thinking about the words of Jesus Christ, it says, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that is what they did. They knew the waters, and they knew there was only so many boats that were there. That, boat went, went, that ship went down in 20 minutes. That's all they had, was 20 minutes. And they knew when they took that life jacket off that their life would be over. But they stayed there. They locked arms. They didn't try preaching. They gave calm and they began to sing psalms in their own language, locked arm in arm, till the ship went down. So I'm sharing this story of their lives to see what insight we can glean from their example. First, I'm going to talk about it with our calling. You see, these men stood on that ship. They understood the day they boarded that ship that their calling could be brought into light. Two, I want to tie that into the end times of how the example of what these men did should be an example for you and I. And then I want to talk about the connection of that service of what they did for those men who were on that boat, just like you and I, that our example, as we stand on the bow of this ship that goes down, may be the example for that innumerable multi multitude yet to be called. So before I go into it, though, I want to relieve or remove a barrier. It's not as prevalent as it used to be in earlier years when I was in the Worldwide Church of God. It's a spirit of self-righteousness to some degree. It's what I mentioned a few minutes ago, but they don't have the truth. And to this day, you'll have people who might feel that way. So I want to remind us of a few scriptures that maybe sometimes we don't think about. This is the one that usually comes to mind. Not everyone to me says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But I profess to them that I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Well, you might say, well, these are Sunday keepers. Well, these are pagan worshipers. They keep Christmas and they keep Easter. But there was a love inside of them that they knew that when they gave up that life jacket, they were going to die. And you can't deny the words of Jesus Christ when he tells us no greater love they have than that. And I remember the Pharisees when they went to and Jesus says, yeah, you tithe on every inch. You have all the laws down, but you forgot the weightier matters of the law of love one to another. So we can't, as a church, get to the end times and look at the people that though God's going to bring into the truth through our works that God grants us to judge them in that fashion before they're called. We have to have an open mind and an open hand to love one another. Remember the Roman centurion? He wasn't converted yet. The Roman centurion says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He watched Jesus Christ and he believed Jesus Christ. He says, for I am a man under authority and have soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goes, and come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and he says to them, Truly I say to you, I have not found so great a faith, not in Israel. But he didn't have the truth. <laughs> you see where I'm getting at? It's the fact of what's inside a person that God wants us to understand. How about this? How about in the days of Elijah and Elijah? Luke 24. So I assure you there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. When the sky was shut for three and a half years, there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them. But he was sent to a woman's Sarepath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet. Not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So, so God doesn't look at things and people like we do. We need to get that through our heads because you see the work we're going into 
is to rub elbows with the unclean. <laughs> you remember the Jews in their day? But they're unclean, right? So this is where we're going today. We're going into those where God is going to bring each one of us. Now the chaplains, all right, the chaplains in World War II, at the beginning of World War II, there were only 242 who were serving at the beginning of World War II. In this big old military like they had, there was only, at that time, 242 at the beginning. It was because of pacifism. Now we look at the church today and you look at what's going on in the world, in our society in America today, it's pretty pacifist. It's like, don't bother me. If it doesn't affect me, don't bother me with it. Because of pacifism and a general anti-war sentiment that affected the recruiting of the chapmans of the armed forces, but in December 7, 1941, the Army had at that time 137 chaplains who were on active duty in the, in the Army and only 105 in the Navy. That's all they had. They couldn't round them up to put them in the military. They couldn't find enough. But by the end of the war, by the end of the war, there were over 1,300 who were actively serving, and they had a waiting list. They had a waiting list. What transpired from here to here? When I see things like this, there's something inside the spirit that says, you know, at the end time, I get phone calls from people saying, how come we're not growing? How come there's only a, peop a person here or a person there? How come we don't fill our churches? Well, we can fill the churches. We can just go to Sunday, keep Christmas, keep Easter. We'll begin to fill the churches. But God has a plan. It's His way. Because you see, by the end of the war, our churches are going to be filled. They may be meeting underground. They may be persecuted. But you cannot deny the fact of Revelation where he says that there will be an innumerable multitude who are going to come out of tribulation. There's something about tribulation and persecution that, that rears up that spirit inside of people who have been touched by God that brings the anger for the atrocities that take place in front of them. We're going to begin to see that. By the end of the, by the, end of the war, 100 chaplains were killed. The second largest percentage being killed of any group right after the foot soldiers in the army. The largest percentage killed were chaplains. 246 chaplains received awards and decorations. They had more received awards and decorations at the end of war than were in chaplain service before the war began. Of that, four distinguished service crosses that went, went to the four men you just saw. The only four times the four men has ever received that award. There were six legions of merit, 48 silver stars, 133 bronze stars, and 54 purple hearts. Those men going to the front lines to serve those people that they were called to serve. Well, you see, I could go to Hebrews 11, and I can begin to show you the chaplains in God's service. And there's a list of them. Revelation says, and this is why I'm telling you this story today, that's not all of them. There's coming another time of martyrdom. We need to realize that. Because each one of us, as I'm going to show you in just a minute, we're going to have to stand on the bow of our own ship. So we can draw a direct parallel from the chaplains who served in World War II that are likened to that to those that are being called in our day. In the overview, looking to the future, there are things that are important to note. Before the war, the majority of America was just lethargic, to what was going on in the world. They didn't even want to get into the war. After the war began, there were tens of millions of people that rose to serve in various responsibilities. And so will it be with the calling of God to those in this world. This is where the innumerable multitude will come from. And third, people were willing to give up their lives in order that freedom and justice would be preserved. How about us? See, we've lived a pretty easy life in the church. Nobody been going after us. Usually if there's any persecution, quite often we bring it on ourselves. But the true persecution is yet at the door. 
Our spiritual connections, we too are the sinking ship. The enemy attacks out of the sea. And I thought this was another interesting point, that that submarine was coming up out of the sea. Look at Revelation 13.1. And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And 17.15 said, And to me he said, The waters which you saw where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Which draw another interesting point to the story of the ship being attacked by the enemy who are coming up out of the waters. The Chapmans had to count the cost. When they got on that boat, they had counted the cost. Each one of us, if you've been baptized, you have done that. So what I'm doing today is trying to ignite, to stir to remembrance your dedication to your calling and your commitment to hold fast to the very end. To the very end. You can't give it up. After the attack, when all chaos broke, the Chapmans were the pivotal example and the stability for all to see. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, we read in Matthew chapter 4, he said there was darkness on the earth. And he came and he brought light. That's what we will be doing. Look at 2 Corinthians. It says, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And it shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The closer you get to Jesus Christ, the brighter your face. You can look at people. You can see the cheer. You can feel the spirit. You can feel the brightness in them. Or you can look at someone who's in a bad spirit and they're grumpy. And they're all hanging down. Their face is always down. And you'll say, well, what's the matter with that person? But when this time comes for our ship, they need to see the light in us, just like they saw in those four chaplains. And the people of the world are going to say, but they don't believe like we do. And it will be reversed. And God will move them to you to be able to bring them stability. They also knew this, that we need to get into our thick skulls from time to time. There was no turning back. Once they got on the ship, there was no going to the captain and say, hey, I changed my mind. Put me off. I'm going back. There was no turning back. Second Peter says, after they had escaped the pollutions of this world, through the knowledge of the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. And the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than afterwards to have known it, to turn from that holy commandment delivered to them. But as it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, that the dog is turned back to his own vomit and the sow was washed and wallowed in the mire. That is the spirit of man. If you turn your hands back from where God has brought us to, you have nowhere to run. And I've talked to people who have literally just turned away from the truth and gone back into the world. And, and I could never get a, an answer like, what are you going back to? There's nothing there. If a person thinks because they don't hold fast to the truth, they're going to escape what's coming, they don't have a clue what's going on. Because the same thing is going to happen to the rest of the world, except with us, God says, he will offer protection. So now, let's take a look at the story through the lives of the end time elect. Our lives on a sinking ship. So we're going to look at it to where we are today in a post-Christian nation. We're going to look at it in three different areas. First, our foundation is a post-Christian nation. Where do we stand? What's going on right now? How are people looking at us? How do we affect the world and what we're doing? Two, what to expect in the culture in which we live. What's amazing is you can stand up and say, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman and it's for life. You have just now labeled yourself as a bigot. And you are now the target on that ship, standing on the bow with the sub heading your way. All you did was confirm what you've always confirmed since you were born. But because you haven't changed, you haven't changed the culture and what you live. It has changed and you have now been moved out. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second with five different cultural ways of preaching Jesus Christ. 
Three, what we must do in a post-Christian nation. What are we supposed to do? How do we act? What's going on? So let's begin with one. Our foundation in a post-Christian nation. So I'm going to have more reading here today than I've done in the past. But I'm trying to bring out things that I've read and put together through a couple of stories that I've been through that help define the times in which we live today to give us a foundation. The evangel evangelical Christian worldview today is now in clear conflict with the established policy on a level unprecedented in American history. Why would I put that up there? Because I still talk to people in the church today who do not preach prophecy, who do not think of end time, who think we have plenty of time, that everything going on today has always been going on. No. Not so. Now, you might have said that seven years ago, but you can't say that today for it to be true. Our culture has previously embraced unbiblical immorality with regard to sexual promiscuity. True, it has. It's embraced it. The LGBT issues, the pornography, divorce, abortion, and euthanasia. But the difference was we were free to practice biblical morality in response. In other words, if that's what you want to do, fine. You go do it. We're going to do what we're going to do. Do you realize that that's not the case anymore? In the past, that's the way it was. So when someone tells you today, it's always been this way, I want you to bring them to the reality of where you stand today. 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't risk going to jail or losing a job or being attacked or persecuted because I simply believed in marriage. That didn't happen. Throughout the time of this nation, it never happened. At the time, no one made us choose or provided abortion. You realize that it is in the Supreme Court now to reverse what was put through that we didn't have to pay for abortions through our taxes is now going up to the Supreme Court again to reverse that decision to take tax money to pay for all the abortions. That'll be coming up pretty soon. They'll probably rule it by May. No one required us to sell pornography in a Christian bookstore. If you owned a Christian bookstore and you had someone who had pornography, if you didn't put their book on the shelf, now they can take away your license and put you in jail. You might win. But who's got the money and the time to do that? In most cases, everyone simply shuts down going on. But now, but now, now the law of the land has endorsed same-sex marriage and may soon ele elevate the LGBTQ persons to a protected class. In other words, if I say that you cannot, God does not accept marriage between male and male or female and female, or he doesn't believe in transgenderism, that is now hate speech. If the law gets through, and there's a law coming, it's called the Equality Act. If that, is, if that is passed, and it has been adopted through the House, the Democrats own the government. It will probably get through the Senate. If it becomes law, there will be no recourse for religious liberty. You need to understand that. That is what's coming. So today, as I preach this sermon, and I go live streaming, if someone's outside the door and they're getting the live stream, they call to the police, come in, shut it down. It's against the law. If you believe it won't happen, then you don't understand prophecy. Because it is coming. That means every minister, every deacon, every speaker in all the churches across the land, if you're going to hold fast to the truth, that means you have chosen to stand on that bow and take off your life jacket if needed. To hold fast to the faith that's been once delivered. Do you realize that? This is how fast things are moving. That is the culture we live today. Evangelicals are viewed as intolerant and discriminatory by our society just as if we're racist, appealing to religious liberty to protect our bigotry. It has been completely reversed. In just a few short years, they have taken what is evil and called good, taken what was good and called evil. That is where we are today. If someone tells you it's always been this way, no, 
It's been that way in certain people's minds, but it's never been the law of the land like it is today. Mm-hmm. Refusing to perform a same-sex marriage is seen as prejudice, just as if we refused to perform an interracial marriage years ago. Amazing how fast things have changed. Our foundation in a post-Christian world, we need to have the courage to stand against oppression. Standing for biblical truth in the face of oppression will require, will require, not that you might have to get it, it's going to be required of you, consistent courage over the years to come. Developing stamina in a post Christian nation. It's not going to be just a week or two weeks. From the time this actually begins to put into place, you will not see it return until Jesus Christ comes back. God warns us it's called the time of the wearing down of the saints. It will eventually move into the period of the time where God warns it'll be like a, a, a person giving birth. Jacob's trouble, God calls it. It's coming. Daniel 7, 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. I don't know about you, but you know, i got to watch a lot of the news. And quite often, i just got to turn it off. And I watch it because of news nuggets and insights. And every week I pray that God will land the spirit that's inside of me, that guides and directs me. And I hope you have the same thing. Your prayer needs to be as my prayer as Paul's prayer and all the disciples, the same spirit that's in me is in you. Is that that spirit will tell you, will warn you, will guide you, and will strengthen you when needed. When there's something good, the spirit will come out and say, well, I need to go see what that is, like the story of these chaplains. And when it's bad, you'll see the anger that will come out of you that you need to control and balance to go to God for direction. Because the great words against the Most High are going to wear out the saints of the Most High. And you'll think to change the times and the laws. And they shall be given into his hand until the time, times, and the dividing of time. That's a promise that God just read. That is a prophecy that you're going to be turned over into the hands of the enemy. I try to come just nice, warm sermons. They never work that way for me. (laughs) i got to tell you the truth. That's like... I started this sermon out when I was, oh, form, oh this is a warm, warm, wonderful sermon that I can give before Passover. So then as I developed into it, the Spirit wouldn't let me go that way and give you nice things. It continued to drive me to a warning. And I thank God for that because, you see, I feel like that's part of the calling God has given me. To warn. To make us all aware and to prepare if I came up here and I told you just the easy side, the wonderful side of what these chapmen have done, I haven't done my job. That hasn't prepared you for what's coming. Because you see, the rest of the world is going to give you all of that. You can get that every Sunday morning. The TV's filled with it. But see, this just promised that you're going to be put into the hands of the enemy. For three and a half years, it says, until the dividing of times is over. Going on in his foundation. Such courage is going to be vital for the faith that we offer is so vital. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Biblical morality is the best way for all of us to live, including the LGBTQ community. Because if they live with morality, they will never be LGBTQ again. It is the only way we can live with the morality of what's right in the words and the eyes of Jesus Christ. It's urgent that Christians understand this fact. And if you're come of confronting with someone who's in the community, you need to tell them they need to repent and they need to change. You need to let them know that God loves them, but they can't stay the way they are. That it's going to bring about their death. And they're going to hate you for it. But God says you tell them anyway. You tell them anyway. If many roads, this is important to understand, if many roads led to the same mountain, when you talk to people in churches around the world, it says, well, we all believe in the same God. doesn't matter. You ever, you ever notice that? If you're trying to argue a point of truth, it always gets into generality. It doesn't matter what you do. Is we all believe in the same God. We're all going to the same place. Let's hope not. <laughs> Let's hope we're not all going to the same place. <laughs> 
Because if you're living in an immoral life, you're not going to have eternity with Jesus Christ. So here, if, if many roads lead to the same mountain, there's no reason to pay a price to convince others to take our road, right? If it doesn't matter, why do this? Why did these men dedicate their lives and give up their lives if it doesn't matter how you get there? Because you see, that's a lie. And anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. If there were many ways to resolve World War II, the military sacrifices paid by so many was unnecessary. There was only one way to win World War II, is to defeat the evil that was trying to overtake this world. See the connection today? There are not many ways to save this planet. There's only one. It is to defeat the evil for Jesus Christ to come back. Going on. If Jesus is not the only way to heaven, we need not face the ridicule of our secular culture for seeking to win others to him. See what I mean? If there's all these ways, why worry about what we're doing? We'll just go preach, we have a good time, eat a lot of food, we have a potluck, go home. The world's going to be a better place. It doesn't work that way. If Peter was wrong in declaring there is salvation in no one else, there is no other name in heaven given among men that we must be saved. There was no reason for him to give up his life to share that salvation with the Roman world. In other words, why would he risk his life if, that was the only, if there was more than just one way? Why don't you just go along with the Romans and say, sure, you can worship all your gods. We're all going to the same place. See my point? You're going to have more and more of this, not Jesus Christ. You're going to move into a Christian society of compromise for fear. So now, two, what do we expect in a, in a culture in which we live. Now we're coming to today. There's a book that was written. It's called Christ and Culture by Richard Nebier. And it was around the 1950s or early 1960s or 40, late 40s or early 50s. Now he's dead now. But this book brought in, by understanding the different cultures, that it brought in a lethargic attitude in the churches. And that is why when the ruling came out that you could lose your 501c3 and lose your taxes at a certain particular time during the government, that the church became just kind of quiet, choosing rather to be a non-committed church, whereas not to lose or offend anyone. So by the time it came to the 60s, when it was important to stand on that bow of that ship, the churches were silent. Evil rose. Prayer was removed. Abortion was allowed, and it began to move on that the generation of free love grew up and took over the government, and God began to move out as the church remained silent. That period of time has accelerated since 2015 to the time you live today. The five cultures that he had was one, Christ against culture, the Christ of culture, the time we live, Christ above culture, Christ and culture in paradox, and the Christ transforming culture. The churches would take its stance that he found in his studies in these five different areas. Now, I've got those five different areas very briefly outlined. You get the book. You'll go through the books and the chapters. It goes into more detail. But I'm going to give you the summary of each one of those so that when someone preaches to you today, you can say, oh, that's of culture, that's against culture, or do they stand for the truth? Richard Nierbo's classic Christ and Culture shows the five ways that the two have related to the church historically. One, a Christ against culture approach is to retreat from the engagement in the, in, with the fallen world. You see the world going down? What do you do? You come back. Well, you know, you get away from it we are less likely to be canceled. That is interesting. He wrote that back 70 years ago. Like, less likely to be canceled. If you speak up in the truth today and you try to go on Facebook or you try to go to Twitter or you get out there, quite, quite often if you're speaking the truth, you're going to be canceled. So if we just get away 
and don't say anything, we're going to be less likely to be canceled. Would you agree with that? If we don't make statements to stand on those social issues, we'll be fine. But this approach is difficult to reconcile with our call to be the salt and light of our culture. You see, inside us, you're going to fight inside. You're going to say, yeah, I need to say something. I need to do something. All right? That's the first one. The second one, a Christ culture approach to adopt a shifting cultural norm of the day. Well, you guys, well, just might wake up, feel like he's a guy today, a girl tomorrow, might be a little bit of both the next day. It's going to be a different culture as they go. So if we change our minds on homosexual activity, and if you notice how fast the government changed, is that from 06, they said, well, you know, there might be okay to have a homosexual movement and get marriage. By 12, Obama was against it. By 16, everybody's for it. By 20, if you're not for it, you're an enemy. We're coming to get you. You've realized how fast that went? What's, what's tolerated today, it's accepted tomorrow, is forced on you the next. That's what this is talking about. If we change our minds on the homosexual activity, for instance, we cannot be accused of homophobia and may be applauded for our intolerance. In 2016, the Republican Party stood up and said, we accept that community. They did. The Republican Party at their convention and everybody stood up and applauded. 2016. 2016, the Republican Party did. But the, but the biblical prohibition against that activity is clear despite the claims to the contrary. In other words, you cannot go through this change of culture, which I just showed you how it's changed in just a few short years, and continue to change with the culture, but the churches are. The largest adoption agency, a Christian agency in America, has just gone nationwide adopting to put children in the LGBTQ homes. Democrats are already there. Already there. Three. A Christ above culture. All right, this is number three approach is to divorce Sunday. I put in Sabbath because he was a Sunday keeper, of course. So I put in Sabbath for you and I. Is to divorce our, our, our worship day from the rest of the week is what he's trying to say here. And religion from the real world. In other words, we just have to take and divorce ourselves. Don't tell anybody what you believe. You know, just kind of get away from all of that. Or live righteously on the Sabbath day and live immorally the rest of the week. That's what this culture teaches. But believe me, the churches do that. So what this man was doing, he's writing all of the different ways these churches live. But to that degree, we are clear about biblical beliefs. At least with our Christian friends, we risk being criticized by them by secular culture. So in other words, if you're going to live with all those other people, if you let them know what you really believe, now you're going to come under persecution because they think you believe something else. Four, all right, the, Christ, the Christ and culture and paradox. There are many churches that are in this position today. Approach engages the cultural issues for the sake of evangelism and ministry, but focuses less on cultural transformation. No, it's just preach Christ to them, leave them alone. Don't worry about changing anything. Let them live the way they want to live. Do whatever they want to do. Just accept Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's what's going on today. And the churches are filling up because the people are, they don't know what to do. Well, maybe they're not filling up with COVID yet, but they were filling up before COVID. And as soon as that settles down, they're going to fill up again. But it doesn't require any transformation of your life. To speak biblical truth on controversial issues, however, is to open ourselves to cancellation, even if we're not attempting to change the culture itself. That's what we're up again. And number five, Christ transforming culture. Very short, very plain. The approach is to seek to change minds, lives, and society. This is where we fall into that category. Such an initiative will especially face op opprobrium, which means persecution, and worse. Those are the different ways that churches use in a culture at the times in which we live today. I thought it was interesting, and I wanted to share that. So now, let's go to number three. So like Peter says, knowing all these things, what must we do, brethren? All right, so let's go through that now. 
What was, must we do in a post-Christian nation? One, see persecution is a call of courage, perseverance. In other words, don't hide from it. Embrace it. In other words, you put your life in Jesus Christ's hands. Whatever he wants for you that you're willing to accept. You have to come to that stage in your life. Every year at Passover, the Bible says, let a man examine himself, and so let him take thereof. That is what we have to do today. You and I, every year from this time forward, your examining yourself is going to bring the bow of this ship ever more closer to your life. You may not be required to take off your life jacket, but you will be required to stand on that bow and be the light of that ship that goes down. David said to the Lord, consider how many my foes are and with what violent hatred they hate me. This is from David. This was the experience of someone whom the Lord described as a man after my own heart. He let David go through that. And through that, David was brought closer and stronger to the Lord. If he faced violent hate, we should expect the same. And we should pray for God's protection as we continue to share God's word. This is the secret to David's courage. This is what he said. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. We must do the same. No matter what happened to him, when his enemies were great and he was hiding and running for his own life, and he did it after he was anointed the king. He ran for his life for almost 12 years. He never took his eyes off of the Lord. Because he knew God was always at his side. Two, we need to seek the reward of God before the acclaim of the culture of this world. It's nice to be liked. We all want to be liked. It's nice to be liked. We don't want enemies. God told Jeremiah when he sent him out as a young man, he says, don't worry about their faces. Because there's going to be some ugly faces out there. They terrify you. I know sometimes I've stood up with people in heaven to have these debates and their face becomes terrifying. So I try to look through it, not at it. Yeah. The warning that God says, don't seek the reward of the world. It is often possible to see. This is interesting. I don't know if you realize this. It is often possible to serve both Christ and Caesar. We always quote the scripture, you can't serve God and man. But there are times you can. Let me give you just a couple examples. Joseph was able to serve the Egyptian pharaoh and his Hebrew family. Never thought about that one. Huh? Like it just doesn't come to mind because we're so conditioned that you can't serve both. There is part that you can do, but there will come a time that you can't. How about this one? Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the Persian king and the governor of Jerusalem. Here's one. Esther was the queen in Persia as well as her people's protector. So you see, there's things that we can do, and God's going to move us. Some people will be moved in positions that are going to be very challenging. Because when it got really bad for the nations, what did God do? He took people and he put them at the head. And he put them at the head to protect his people. And I believe at the end time when the persecution comes, God's going to move some of his people into those positions of favor to protect his people. I believe that. But when we must choose, we must choose Christ over Caesar. There cannot be any compromise. You understand what that is? There may come a time the government says, you have to go do that, and you may not like it. You have to wear a mask. Well, I don't like wearing a mask. Well, go wear a mask anyway. Is it breaking God's law? No. But if he says you can't meet on the Sabbath anymore, you have to worship on Sunday, now you've got a problem. See what I mean? There will be times that you can listen and not like it. And there will be times that you will listen and not do it. Because you can't. Going on. Continued. Peter and John said the Sanhedrin that demanded the apostles to cease preaching. And they said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to obey God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak what we have seen and heard. See, they got them to a point. They're not listening to him. It had reached the point that they could not listen to Caesar. 
Daniel continued to pray God in defiance of the king. Jeremiah was asked to risk his life to speak prophetic truth to the king. There comes a time that you have to make the decision. Can I do both or not? It's paradoxical fact that the less we seek the acclaim of people, the more faithful we can minister to them. If you're trying to be friends with the world, you will not find the strength to minister to the world. You can't do both. You have to serve God to minister to the people. Three, choose to engage in the culture of truth and grace. Jesus' words embold, em, emblazoned the libraries and the universities across the land. It says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But this context is vital and is usually ignored. Because, see, we live in today that says truth is just conjectural. It's your truth. It's my truth. You might believe it. I believe this. You believe that. Jesus Christ says there's only one truth. In a previous verse, Jesus said to the Jews that believed on him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples. It wasn't their truth or my truth. It was one truth. It was Jesus' truth. Only on this condition. That was the only condition that there was the truth. He says, you have to abide in my word. See, the churches don't believe that. When you get into the debates about certain points of knowledge and doctrine, they will come into the, hey, you can do whatever you want to do. No, you can't. Jesus Christ was very clear, but only on the condition that you abide in my word. Now, I'm going to caution everybody. Don't get into those foolish debates. Get into this and say, what does the word of God say? If you can do that, have the words flow from your lips, you will stop them in their tracks. When they argue from that point, they're no longer arguing with you. They're arguing with God. And you are on safe ground. That means you have to know the Bible. You've got to get your nose in the Bible. Only on this condition would they know the truth to be set free. It's urgent that we continue to speak biblical truth to our cultural issues, but it's urgent that we speak truth in love and the fact that kindness, especially on the important response to others. Paul's exhortation to Timothy. Now, we're going to begin to start wrapping down to the, to the end phase of this. Paul encouraged Timothy to fight the good fight and to fight the faith, to pursue righteousness, godly faith, and love, steadfast and gentleness, and to pursue, I love these words what Paul had here, to pursue, the Greek word means to run after really hard, these virtues in a fallen culture is indeed a fight. Then he says, devote yourself to the reading of the scripture, which I was saying just a few minutes ago. Now look at the words of what he had, to fight, to pursue, and to devote. These are just not general words that are out there. These are words driven, driven hard to a purpose. Paul's example to Timothy and to the brethren, he was standing on a bow. Paul was on the bow of the ship. Now, let me show you the example of Paul of, to Timothy that's been recorded for you and I in this world. What do you think might be going through Timothy's mind when he heard all these things? See, Timothy was a young man when Paul went to his hometown. Let me let's read that. Paul's example to Timothy while standing on the bow of a sunken ship going down. Danger and the likelihood of imminent death were no strangers to Paul and to Timothy, by the way. As Paul's associate, Timothy saw firsthand from the very beginning all the probability that Timothy came to faith through Paul's first missionary journey. Because when Paul went on the second journey, he's got him with him. So it was through Paul's coming through the first time that Timothy began to hear the words of Paul that began to change him. Paul's visit to Lystra was Timothy's hometown. That was where Timothy lived, where Paul came to. But it's interesting because some unusual events took place right there. In that city, certain events took place that changed Timothy's life. Paul's ministry began with the healing of a lame person. Paul just told him to get up and walk, which prompted the people of Lystra to worship Paul and Barnabas as gods. They didn't know what they were saying. Here's a man just comes in. This guy's been lame. He couldn't walk. Paul says, get up and walk. They walk. But he's God's. And when Paul heard about it, he terrified himself. He went and ran after him, tore his clothes and said, stop. And he's kneeling down. We're people just like you are to stop the whole thing. 
But with great difficulty, they finally persuaded the town people to cease worshiping them. But then something even more amazing happens. All right? Something even more amazing. Acts 14. But the Jews from Antioch and Iconium came after winning over the crowds, the ones who made them gods. And Ron Dorr taught this years ago that I never forgot. To the degree they put you on a pedestal will be the degree that they will hate you if you ever turn sour. So if you think you're doing really good, if it ever turns, you're going to be doing just as bad. So now the people who are worshiping them as gods, now they got to be turned them around and they stoned Paul and they dragged him out of the city presuming he was dead. So now from a god, they've dropped to he's dead. Timothy was there. Timothy saw that. Timothy watched him on the bow of that boat take off his life jacket. Continued preaching till he was dead, they thought. And they drug him out of the city. And it brought everyone to conversion through the persecution. So, but after his disciples had surrounded him, he got up and went back into the city. Now, you know, I don't know that he was really dead or not really dead. The Bible doesn't tell you. They make no issue about that here. It appeared he was dead. He was at least unconscious. But, but when he's surrounded by the people, the spirit inside him got up. Now, he's got to be pretty beat up and bruised. Be left for dead. Just get up and walk back into the city. He wouldn't finish yet. He went and got back on the bow of that boat. That was Timothy's hometown. Timothy's hometown. So the next day, he left with Barnabas and Derby. And after they had proclaimed the good news in that city, he made many disciples and they returned to Lystra, Iconia, and Antioch. And they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, we must enter the kingdom of God through many persecutions. That is what I'm telling you today. If we're going to get into the kingdom, what's on our doorstep, just like with the Apostle Paul, I mean, his example of taking his life jacket off and giving it to those people there, put his life on the line. They looked like they killed him. He got up and he went back and he got some more. And what did he do? He converted those people because he talked about love. He talked about Jesus Christ. He didn't talk about going after those people who did that to him. And he won them over. That connects to you and I at the end time where we're going to. All of us are going to be required to stand on the bow. If you think you're going to get short of that, you're not. Everyone is going to be held accountable. Some few, some few are going to be required to give up their vest. There's coming a future mortem. We've read that many, many times before. He opened up the fifth seal and he saw the altars of those who were slain for the word of God and the testimony for which they held. That's coming. We can pray, God says, we can pray to escape all these things to come. Some are not, you need to embrace yourself that you're not going to escape some of these things. Look at verse 10. O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Verse 11, same chapter. That they should rest for a little season, God says, until their fellow servants also, their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. That's coming. If a church today, with what you see going on, is not preaching some of these messages, they're not being honest to their people. They're not. Through it all, it says there will be an innumerable multitude that will come out of tribulation. When you go through those things and you're being persecuted, it'd be just like when Paul got up, walked back into the city and converted that town. Part of the reason God is going to allow a persecution. Look in Colossians. And we begin to wrap it up. I'm almost finishing about five, five minutes or so. So now I rejoice in that I am suffering for you. Look at Paul's commitment to his calling. When he got on that ship, when God blinded him, he says, what did he tell Paul? I, the only one in the Bible I know went through this. He says, let me show you what great things you're going to have to suffer for my namesake. So Paul, not like you and I, Paul knew when he got on that ship, he's not getting off that ship. He had to make that decision. You and I are on that ship. This world is going down. There's a salvation at the end of this trip. It's called Jesus Christ, and he's coming. And in that ship, there'll be some that's going to be going down when that ship goes, travels. 
But here's the commitment that Paul made when he got on that ship. I now rejoice in what I am suffering for you. Can you do that with the people around you? People who have mistreated us. And I tell you, I have to work on my attitude from time to time. People who have been talk about me, reject me, or <laughs> want to attack me. And then they come to you for help. And you want to say, why are you coming to me? <laughs> but you see, we have to. We need to get to the stage with Paul. He says, I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. Paul says, I'm doing it for you because you're the body of Jesus Christ. One of these days, our churches, the churches at large, they're going to quit saying, I'm of this organization, I'm of that organization, because we are of the body of Jesus Christ, and that is the church. And we need to do like those four chaplains, and lock arms with one another, and say, what can we do to help? Oh, I long to see that day for the church. He said, I become its servant by the commission God gave to me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, which is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present to everyone fully mature in Jesus Christ. To accept what Paul's talking about, to suffer for other people, you're going to have to have the maturity of Jesus Christ. It's be very hard on your own. He said, to this end, I strenuously contend, he says, with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me, you have to be in touch with the Spirit of God that's inside of you. That means you need to be in touch with God. And if you're in touch with God, He will stir that Spirit up in you. When the time comes that He needs to call upon you, that Spirit will arise. He will give you the things you need to do the job at the time. Now, Closing this thing out. I thought I had one more scripture. Uh, well, but I don't. I, I, didn't, I didn't put it in. So anyway, I was finished and did not know it. So let me wrap it up. Let me wrap it up. It would be easy for me to come here every Sabbath and speak smooth things. But that would be dishonest to you all. You and I have been called to walk on that gangplank, to get on that boat, and to sail to wherever God takes us. We have to be the light so that when everyone was jumping off of that boat, they seen those four men locked arm in arm, singing hymns in their own language. They did not try to preach a sermon. They lived one. And it brought hope to everybody who was in those boats. Only 200 and I think 30 or 40 people lived out of those 900. All the rest died. But the story of what they did lived to this day. And I'm telling you, what God does through you, that somewhere in the millennial reign, that story will live during that period of time. He's done it from the Old Testament, we read about it in the New Testament. The New Testament, what they did at the time of Jesus Christ, we read about today. There's no reason to think that God's going to do things differently. Our calling is sure. Our commitment is in your hands. Pray that God will give us the strength to stand like these four men who may not have had the truth, but they had the love of Jesus Christ. I hope that helps everybody prepare for Passover.